People always say they want more. More features, more options. But what if our businesses were far more powerful with less? Not less capability, just less clutter and complexity. We believe that less is more, and that true simplicity is powerful because it frees you to experience what matters most, clarity, efficiency, impact. Experience Nutanix, all the power imaginable in a simple, elegant enterprise cloud platform. It all started with recognizing tremendous amount of complexity that's there in the infrastructure space and asking, does it really have to be this complex? We believe if you can marry consumer grade design with web scale engineering, we can build beautiful and powerful products that are accessible to the masses. What we are trying to do from a business perspective is to enable the people in the data centers to be able to achieve a lot more with a lot less effort. It's all about looking at what the customer wants to solve as a problem and see what's the current experience and how can we enhance it. Our ambition here is to keep the experience with our products uncompromisingly simple. People want really powerful features in a very simple interface. We are an engineer company, we sell very complex products, but we put design first. The three principles of design that we follow at Nutanix are intentional, opinionated, and delightful. Intent-based design is all about enabling the person to accomplish whatever they intend to do without going through a series of procedural steps. You're asking the user to say what the intention is rather than asking the user what the steps are to reach your end goal. That's how we do upgrades as well. We tell the system this is where we want to go as a software release and the system figures out the path to get there. Opinionated design is a minimalistic design philosophy. It's all about providing a small set, but the right set of choices. We would like to bring the opinion into what the product has, but still give you a menu of choices which really matter to you. For example, we drive clarity in capacity planning by not flooding the user with a plethora of choices. Instead, we present a small set of precise recommendations to expand with a single click. We also have a built-in search engine that presents a small, targeted set of results. This saves valuable time, even when performing complex tasks. Once we have a really good foundation, we try to bring delight on top of it. That's typically something we only find in our consumer technology products. But we believe at Nutanix that we can have the same bar for delightful experiences in the enterprise technology space as well. This is a radical shift in the industry. Infrastructure will no longer be top of mind. The focus will now shift to the human experience that rests on top of this infrastructure. We are going to look back at this decade as the decade the data center came out of the dark ages. We have the processes, the people, the appreciation and commitment to design that will make us an enduring company for the long run. What we are seeing today is the outcome of our investments in the last five to six years. And this is just the beginning of what the team is going to deliver. This is Dheeraj, CEO Hi. of Nutanix. That was a really nice video. Thank you. Um, the first question I have for you is, what motivated or inspired you to invest so heavily in design at Nutanix? You know, I think uh, computing was going through a big shift, um, especially in the last five years. Uh, infrastructure in general, uh, there were a ton of boxes, there were a ton of software, there were a ton of components. And then came this idea of a public cloud, uh, which uh, basically said, you don't need a lot of these things. Uh, you know, you can, it's kind of the zenith of invisibility in some sense, right? So uh, that uh, phenomenon was upon the enterprise in a big way. And uh, you know, as you see from uh, people in this uh, video, a lot of the right brain people were forced to think, uh, uh, think about the product. A lot of the left brain people were, think, were forced to think like the why and the how Mm -hmm. of the company itself. Uh, and 
I think that was the core of the company, that look, we can't just build yet another cheaper, faster system or a software component or a box itself, because uh, the substitute of the public cloud is basically our competition in the future. So and we need to bring that uh, element of invisibility into everything we actually do. And uh, I think having to ask the question of why and how before the what, because engineers otherwise, especially in the space that we are in, they focus on the what a lot. You know, what capabilities, what features. And then they tend to go and optimize for the last 20%, which is the power user. Right. When there's so much to actually do for the first 80%, where opinions matter, where you need to know why is it more than a click, uh, and what are the default values and, and things like that. So. Uh, as a company, and by the way, this is something that we really live and die for in the company. Why first, how, and then the what. Um, and two of my uh, favorite people in the last two, three years, uh, they say the same thing, by the way. One is uh, Simon Sinek, who is a, a TED Circuit speaker. And he talks about how most people focus on the what, when they should really start with the why, and then the how, and then the what. And uh, Deepak Malhotra was probably somewhere there in the, in the audience as well. He speaks something very similar you know, when it comes to negotiation. Because he'll talk about the why in his talk as well, about empathy. Mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, why do people do the way they do things? And uh, you know, why do we need to go and change this? And then you talk about the how itself, uh, which uh, is, he says, process before substance. You know? So process is the how, and substance is the what itself. So it's fascinating how two of the best people that I actually learn from say the exact same things. You know? And uh, that's the real differentiation of Nutanix, actually. We don't talk about boxes and speeds and feeds and cheaper and faster, because that's a race to the bottom, actually. You know? Wow. So how do you put that into practice? The how do you get everybody focused on the why and the how first? Um, it's a culture shift as well. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you think of uh, the organization, you know, um, most uh, South Bay companies—I'm going to call them South Bay companies because they're more left brain than right brain. Mm -hmm. Most South Bay companies, they put product managers as the face of uh, defining everything. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to internalize the why. They're supposed to probably figure out the how as well, <clears throat> and then they come and deliver the what. Uh, to the uh, engineering team and the designers, if they have designers. We actually turned it upside down. We said, look, uh, product managers are curators. And the real communication that happens between the customers uh, and the practitioners uh, is direct with the designers and engineers. Because the engineers need to appreciate why and how before they get to the water itself. Um, and even the company's mission, I think, we said, look, we need to first talk about the why, then the how, then the what. So the company's mission is, uh, why does the company exist? It's invisible infrastructure. We need to make infrastructure invisible. How do you do it? Distributed systems, which is about bringing Taiwan to the mass masses and then using software on top. That's distributed systems or web scale engineering. And then the consumer grid design, which actually makes it usable and consumable, uh, because otherwise you know, you're just shipping uh, you know, extremely profound esoteric things that people don't really know how to appreciate. And finally, the what is, OK, we're building an enterprise cloud itself. So I think organizationally, mission-wise, we actually have done things uh, very differently. Like when we sit in these uh, uh, product meetings, we start with two things. Like, OK, guys, if you don't have design, we don't have APIs, then we're not sitting in this room and talking about a new thing. Because design is about man-machine interface or human-machine interface, mm -hmm. right? And API is about machine-machine interface. So like, if we can't talk about these two interfaces, then it's not worth sitting in this room and having any discussion at all. Uh, so it started really early uh, with uh, the mission of the company and then going from there to uh, how do we design the organization and how do you make designers as product managers, you know, because uh, if they can't really uh, don the mantle of product uh, you know, management itself, then you have too much of delegation and specialists who actually are doing baton passing, but they have cognitive biases, and mm -hmm. there's a loss in translation, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very radical shift from the waterfall way of doing things itself. And uh, then uh, finally being able to you know, you know, kind of elevate the role itself. You know, I, uh, I went to San Francisco and uh, spent days with our first designer. I mean, you know, went to his home and knocked at his door and said, you know, you have to move to South Bay. Like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, 
Uh, South Bay is a boring part of uh, the world, actually, even though it's part of Silicon Valley, it's really considered to be a different part of Silicon yeah. Valley. So culturally, we had to make that change. You know, we figured out how they could, uh, some of these right brain people could move to like Mountain View, at least, you know, because anything south of that is sacrilege for them. <laughs> Uh, and the fact that they could take the bot and go to the city, the, the cool happening place right. uh, when, they ha when they need to. Um, and from then on, I think, you know, how do you build the rest of the team around these kind of people? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, personal relationships that uh, founders need to have with these people as well, because uh, the first six months is the kind of the uh, period of vigil where you realize that you could either have a ton of antibodies who actually will expel some of these uh, things that are foreign to an enterprise company, to an infrastructure company. Uh, or you, uh, you know, end up uh, figuring out what it means to really make them feel at home. So a lot of those things that we actually did uh, have brought us to where we are today. I mean, if you look at our hackathons these days, you know, we do twice a year hackathons. And the reason why we have uh, you know, productive hackathons is because what people see is not just five days of back-end work, but there's a ton of front-end work that goes with it. And that's visceral. You know? It brings this element of completeness, this aha, delightful uh, sort of experience. That, like We absolutely need to have this as part of the product uh, in the next six months and so on. And uh, it's been a journey of the last five years, but uh, I think uh, we extremely feel uh, you know, good about where the company is really headed there. You know? That's awesome. It sounds like um, having the designers involved up front and making the vision tangible is a nice rallying point for the rest of the company to say, yes, this is what we want to build. And yeah, yeah. In fact, and in everything we do, like, you know, what does an infrastructure company do? It does a lot of things that are buried deep in the bowels of, uh, you know, compute and processing and things that don't really uh, come up uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to value, right? So you take a ton of these mundane things and make them delightful, and uh, it matters a lot. I mean, we have done so many things uh, with these workflows that would take like weeks and months and try to convert them into uh, minutes and hours, uh, that that becomes the rallying point uh, for the grassroots people. Because who are we competing with, especially if you think of the last five years? We're competing with a lot of these entrenched incumbents who mm -hmm. would make billions of dollars uh, in this market with relationships and golfing and dining and whining and stuff like that. You know? So uh, the only way to disrupt them is go to the grassroots mm -hmm. and make the grassroots feel like this is their product. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we bring their weekends back because you know, these are people who don't get any kind of gratitude for what they do. It's very thankless jobs, right? So you're going to elevate all that uh, and their, uh, the way they actually become innovators for the first time. You know, it helps a lot. And I think, again, the big reason for us was that the computing space is a half a trillion dollar market. You know, there's uh, about 215 billion of things, which is the what? Boxes, software components, which people call the capex. And there's another 300 billion of people cost, actually, you know. IT employees, salaries, professional services, system integrators, they do a lot of that, reinventing the wheel every time. So our differentiation had to be like, we can't just go and talk about building a cheaper, faster box, but we had to get enough of this 300 billion and automate the heck out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the manifestation of automation? It's design. You, know, you had to say, you know, unless we really designed it right, automation really doesn't really cut it. So this really goes beyond like hiring this one guy and convincing him to move south. Like you really had to kind of change the company culture. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like what were some of the challenges that you encountered and how did you make this massive shift? Mm, yeah. So I mean, uh, obviously uh, it was clear to us why we were doing what we were doing. Uh, but you know, things like design sprints, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that uh, we're not actually just getting this what from the product managers, but uh, you know, realizing that designers actually have to be product managers. And uh, we do these in sprints because then what's available mm -hmm. uh, is the right consumption uh, model. You know, we know that this is exactly the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And then we iterate on it you know, on a regular basis. Uh, in the waterfall scheme, design comes last. You, know, you actually talk about the what first, like, oh, well, it's faster, it's 10x this, and so on. And finally, like, oh, we forgot about two things, APIs and design. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just turned it upside down. And with that, we do these design sprints where the mock-ups come up first. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, 
what's front and center is not the what, but the how. You know, and that differentiation comes out right away. It's like the way Amazon talks about press releases. Like, without a press release, please don't even talk about a new thing. I think for us, it's design and API. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about mockups first. And uh, this is too many clicks. Like, you know, the, this is like seven clicks when it should be one click. And then a lot of the arguments happen about how seven can become two at least, mm -hmm. which is where opinions come in. You know, it's like, you know, you have to have opinionated uh, sort of design here, you know. Because if you're not solving for the 80%, you're not reducing enough friction. Uh, and then you're really look, thinking like an engineering company rather than a product company that's trying to go and disrupt uh, incumbents. All who care for is boxes, boxes, and more boxes. Um, I think uh, the way we've hired, like, you know, we go to Berkeley Design School, we go to Stanford, we go to a lot of uh, schools in India now uh, to figure out uh, uh, you know, campuses that actually have uh, great design programs as well as engineering programs, how they've melded it together, actually. You know. um, and you have to find the right balance because sometimes you err too much inside of design versus user experience. Mm -hmm. and, you get the wrong people. I'm sure you've actually gone through a similar mm -hmm. sort of uh, in the last 10, 15 years of your life as well. So maybe you could also tell us about how you have helped us. Uh. <laughs> I feel the interview table turning here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, Nutanix, I really love working with your company. And uh, speaking of design sprints, I was uh, very proud to be involved in one of the first design sprints that uh, Nutanix implemented. And uh, the motivation there was really to try to teach the cross-functional team how to work together um, in a different way so that everybody was involved early and up front. Um, so we, we chose a project. This was the reporting project. And uh, you know, day one is to understand user needs and build empathy. And I remember then the first day, the product manager came in with kind of the classic enterprise kind of way where it's like, okay, these are the personas, these are the requirements, these are the constraints, here's the spec. Designers, go create the mock-ups, and engineers, go build whatever the designers design. And what we were trying to do in this design sprint was to get all the functions in together at the same time to help build a shared understanding of what the user problems were, and then collectively brainstorm uh, a wide range of solutions rather than have the product manager offer the solution. Um, and what was so wonderful about this was that your engineers are really amazing. They started coming up with these crazy ideas like, oh, well, why don't we just automate this in the background and we can just you know, do the right thing for people without having the user explicitly say this. And they were signing up for extra work, um, but they were really motivated to do that because the ideas came from them. And, um, and then you know, the, the team was working together to kind of create that experience. And it ended up with far fewer screens it really was as close to an invisible interface as possible. And that's something, that's an outcome that would not have been conceived the way the team, the cross-functional team members had been working before. Yeah. And so it's nice to see that this is kind of now a new standard of practice mm -hmm. for the Well, the I think what's, uh, this idea of minimalism, what it also is triggering is uh, doing more within the machine itself, so that mm -hmm. you don't escalate as much to humans. Mm -hmm. So machine learning is becoming a big part of the overall fabric of the company because you know that machines have to do more, and you have to reduce escalations, and, uh, you know, because otherwise the man-machine boundaries being, you know, sort of uh, the biggest enemy of most product design companies. You know, if you look at most of the box companies of the past 15, 20 years, they escalate everything to humans. And we all know what our biggest challenge is in the you know, coming uh, years is human time. You know, it's like, what's the one thing you can really go and uh, do a great job of in terms of efficiency is human time. There's mm -hmm. only 24 hours in a day, and most people have to do more with less. So while a lot of the incumbents and a lot of uh, even the next generation competitors, they focus on machine time, reducing machine time, which anyway follows Moore's law, actually. You know, it's like, well, it's going to get faster. The silicon is going to be cheaper and faster every 18 months. We said, if you pick uh, human time as the thing to go and optimize for, people will pay us 10x more. Mm -hmm. And I think that realization has made us into a very strong company. I mean, one of the things I talk about is how come we made a billion dollars in four and a half years, and we have to make another billion in the next 12 to 15 months? I think that can only have been possible if you reduce friction uh, you know, in a really, really different way than what most other companies actually do. And, and 
you know, people feel like we gave their weekends back in a big way because of the way we've actually done the how part of the product rather than just focusing on the what, which is cheap, fast, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It also speaks to how your company interprets design, which is more, it's beyond uh, what you see and what you experience, but uh, it's really about you know, giving back to the people who yeah, are using yeah, your products. And I think you know, design to us is now all encompassing. You know? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, it started with product design, then it was about organizational design, mm -hmm. how Yammer and Slack are a big part of uh, this feedback process. You know, it comes all the way from customers. I mean, if you have, we have external users on our internal Slack instance, uh, which uh, wow. uh, makes it just, I mean, every, on an everyday basis, we have these uh, customer advisory boards where mm -hmm. people are from these other companies and they're interacting with our engineers and our designers in a big way. Um, and then finally, business design, like for example, you know, we're introducing a new product, and that's supposed to be zero friction product because it's for the SMBs. You know, we were a premium brand for the last four or five years, and now trying to figure out how to take that premium brand and, and push it down into the uh, down market. You know, in the SMBs, and then you start thinking about business processes that need to be one click as well. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this element of design that was true for the product is now you know really gone all the way to you know business processes and things like that. So. Because you know, the big challenge upon us is that e-commerce and computing are blending in a big way. You know, obviously, what Amazon is doing with spot pricing and credit card payments and you know, things like that will be everywhere. So what the analysts, I mean, they use a state word called consumerization of the enterprise. It's a difficult word to pronounce. But in reality, it's really about bringing delight. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the way we talk about our company is, Look, we had to build the battery, which is the left brain of the company. But we don't make money on the battery. We build a, a car, which is different, right? Which is computing in general, you know. So, uh, you know, to us, the first phase of building the battery was to get rid of uh, storage boxes and you know, things that people used to store data on. But now we're going and saying it's not just these large storage incumbents, but also virtualization companies like VMware. You don't need to exist. Because if you look at the true north of the public cloud, they don't talk about you know, making money off of you know, virtualization software and uh, storage software, things like that, in that way. So there's a ton of new opinion being forced upon uh, our, our end users. So that could create friction, because you're talking about new architecture, new consumption model. Uh, and the only way to actually neutralize that uh, friction is to do something that's radically different in design itself, which like, in a moment, people, they do a demo, and like, you know what, I want this product, kind of stuff. And it's not just about aesthetics, you know, there's so much more that goes into it in terms of reducing friction itself. Like uh, metaphors of App Store, they're really relevant. Now, people have been talking about App Store for the last five years in the enterprise, but nobody has really spent time thinking about, uh, you know, the, the details, which is where the real design actually happens. I mean, uh, if you were to look at one of our incumbent competitors, VMware, they talk about a very uh, left-brain term called micro-segmentation, which is about you know, figuring out how to really take security and make it personal to a, uh, an application. But in reality, unless you really know how to deploy it in two clicks uh, or one click, you're not making micro-segmentation democratic, you know, democratic enough mm -hmm. in that sense. So application users can't even use it, and then it just becomes a term, which is a shelfware software more than anything else. So really making uh, this idea of uh, you know, applications and apps be imminently consumable by folks who never know how to, knew how to use it, like you know, mm -hmm. how to use security and how to use networking, uh, I think is going to come down to design, actually. You guys look at every single customer touch point and try to make that the best experience possible. And one, another great example is, uh, and Satish and I were talking about this, uh, your d senior director of um, design. Um, how many enterprise, uh, enterprise uh, companies will kind of bury uh, customer support escalations because that it results in increased costs. And you guys actually have the button front and center. Um, and it's kind of a symbol to everybody that works in the company that there's no problem that's uh, too small to be escalated. And it's a symbol, it, it re kind of represents that the customers come first. Absolutely. And, and in fact, it uh, also bypasses some of our distribution gunk. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. because. Obviously, as we need to go uh, far and wide in terms of distribution, we're using OEM partners. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of the OEM partners, they want to make more money off of our software. So they're like, oh, we would like to do support for, for the company because that's where the jostling happens, you know, the share of the wallet discussions and mm -hmm. so on. But the true north is being missed because the true north is customer delight. Mm -hmm. So by putting some of these business process things as one-click things in the product itself, you're bypassing all this sort of elbow pushing that's happening about who makes more money and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, people know that this is where the true north of support should really lie. So we're thinking about a lot of things which is beyond just the end user because there's reality that comes in as well and distribution and its challenges mm -hmm. and how they need to make money and how do you need to make it win-win without really losing sight of the end user mm -hmm. itself. Let's talk about the business impact of design. Because uh, two years ago, your net promoter score was already really high. It was like 73. And um, you know what it is now? Yeah, it's 92. And, yeah. and by the way, we live and die by it. I mean, at some level, uh, that's what sells for us is uh, the idea of net promoter score. Because we've reduced friction uh, to a point where people really look at uh, the app that we've built that hides all this infrastructure details. Uh, as the big reason why they actually buy Nutanix, you know, because it's uh, all subsuming and we're adding more and more components under the covers, actually, you know. And uh, more than just that, if you look at the uh, kind of the real business impact, it's like uh, dollars and cents. We've made a billion dollars in the last four and a half years. We have to make another billion in the next four, uh, 12 months, actually, you know, so That's awesome. it's all happening because of uh, reducing friction. That's, that's great.